you know, the Islamic parties, one of the ways they attack these governments is to say, you know, you're not Muslim enough. And so the governments fight back by trying to prove their Muslim credentials. And one of the ways they do it is by shutting down any kind of debate or dialogue. This is Faith Complex, a dialogue about the entanglement of religion, politics, and art. Hello, my name is Jacques Rolinoblau of Georgetown University, and you're watching Faith Complex. Joining us today is Mr. Neil McFarquhar, UN Bureau Chief of the New York Times, and author of the excellent book, The Media Relations Department of Hezbollah Wishes You a Happy Birthday, Unexpected Encounters in the Changing Middle East. Mr. McFarquhar, welcome to Faith Complex. Thank you. Even though your name, Neil McFarquhar, strikes me as some type of synthesis between an Irish and an <laughs> Arabic name, you are in fact not a person of Arab descent, even though you grew up um, in Libya. Uh, what was it like being an ostensibly Western guy covering uh, every corner of the Arab world? Yeah, it's a Celtic name. My father mm -hmm. was from Northern Scotland. But, um, you know, just because Arabs don't control their own sort of political lives, they kind of don't blame you personally for the policies of the American government. Um, and so I was always warmly welcomed and treated very well. Um, the one exception was 2003, because that was the year of the invasion of Iraq. And there was sort of just, you know, every time anybody turned on their TV, there would be sort of American tanks rolling across Iraq or soldiers kicking in doors. And so that's when the one time people were overtly hostile. I mean, I never faced anything. You should have seen France in 2003. <laughs> I went as the American representative to France. So it was bad in the Arab world also, I understand? Well, I mean, just because people would see it on TV. And, they, you know, I mean, they wouldn't, they weren't, yeah, occasionally, like someone threw a Coke can at me, you know, in Jeddah and Saudi Arabia and Egyptian waiters as soon as they, you know, I'd always say, I'd say I was from New York instead of I was from an American because I would keep the banter going for a minute and then they would cut it off. Let's talk about television because you concentrate a lot on television, in particular what I think you see as the salutary role that Al Jazeera played in the recent history of the modern Middle East. Tell us a little bit about Al Jazeera and the good that it did. Yeah, I mean it has a terrible reputation just because, you know, everyone thinks it's all Osama bin Laden all the time. It was criticized by the United States, but it, there were times when, you know, <laughs> The guy, the, the, the Jazeera correspondent in Egypt was in jail. They'd been expelled from Iraq. The bureau in Amman, Jordan, had been shut down. The you know bureau in Bahrain had been shut down because the governments got angry with it all the time because they really sort of pushed the envelope. Could you identify a political agenda there? I mean, uh, certainly folks in Israel and folks uh, center right in the United States saw a very clear anti-American, anti-Israel agenda. It, Could you see it, that? It cleaved that way more because mm -hmm. what happened was is someone opened a competing channel and sort of all the people um, who didn't believe in sort of the nationalist or um, you know religious agenda left the station but I never really in the news I always I mean I kept them on in my hotel in my office all the time because they were fast with the news and Israel for example I mean Israeli politicians fought to get on mm -hmm. that show because it gave them this huge direct audience yeah. in the Arab world um, and so they you know they just they just broke a lot of taboos and you know, people ask, were they inciting? I mean, did they go out and say attack? No. But, you know, yes, did they color the news or did they use footage that would make people dislike the people they disliked? Yes. You know, I always tell my students, find out what the author is after. And I think this is what the author is after. So here's a quote from your book. Many Westerners use the word change as a synonym for progress, a step toward increased freedom, enlightenment, and modernization. But change writes Mr. McFarquhar, can be a leap in the opposite direction. I sense in a lot of this text that there's change going on in the Middle East, except unfortunately, it's in the opposite direction. I think, you know, I don't, I don't think you can, I mean, one thing about the Arab world is you can't say they're all the same. Um, you know, there are differences in, in every country, and I think you see places like Morocco where there is a much stronger civil society, and they really are sort of pushing against the laws, but they've got a very, I mean, the one thing that is the same in all those countries is that there's a small group of people, whether it's a tribe or a group of officers or a, a royal family that, you know, have a lock on power, and, you know, they will not give it up without a fight. So. When people are faced with those kind of odds, they, they, you know, the, the, the one outlet they've had is sort of you know, Islamist parties because they are sort of free to operate in the mosques, etc. And so I think that you know, the combination of the lack of political freedom, lack of social um, 
space, like of civil, civil society, sort of pushes people into, into sort of more radical or more extremist positions than they might normally if they had, if they had an outlet. Your portrait of the Arab Islamic world corroborates something that I've learned speaking to many Muslim intellectuals and many Imams, namely that the problem is not Islam per se, the problem is the inability to discuss all the things that Islam might be in public. Do you think there's any warrant to that? It's a problem because, you know, the Islamic parties, one of the ways they attack these governments is to say, you know, you're not Muslim enough. And so the governments fight back by trying to prove their Muslim credentials. And one of the ways they do it is by shutting down any kind of debate or dialogue. Um, but, you know, it sort of depends. Mohammed Shahrur uh, is a civil engineer in Syria, and he wrote a book saying, you know, that we need to divide Islam in half. There's a political Islam and there's a spiritual Islam. And the spiritual Islam succeeded enormously. And the political Islam, Muhammad tried to set up a state and he failed mm -hmm. and so we have to try and sort of figure out how to divide that in our own lives and you know some people say that's blasphemy now in Syria he's allowed to publish something like that um, but I think that you know the problem comes back again to the government sort of trying to outflank their opposition and so they squash any kind of public discussion mm -hmm. on those sort of topics. I'm going to push you a little bit as much as I enjoyed the book uh, I sense that you work with a paradigm which goes something like this great people terrible governments. But given that this is such a bleak picture that you've, you've drawn for us, uh, at what point do we just start blaming the people and saying that the people are going to have to do something to change the terrible government? Um, it's, it's difficult. I mean, I don't think it's asking too much that for people to agitate against their governments, but, you know, it, you, you're, you're, you're risking jail, you're risking your life in some cases, and, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a high price to pay. They think about it all the time. I mean, there's a, um, there is a poet that I interviewed in Jordan. He said, you know, he went to jail for a year um, because of um, one, po one poem that he wrote uh, against the king. It, it, it's also sort of a society thing because, you know, it's not just the person that's held responsible. Mm -hmm. It's the whole family yeah. and the whole tribe in some cases. So until they can sort of overcome that, it's going to be hard to see where, you know, there's sort of people welling up in the streets and demanding change in, in that way. I read your elegiac epilogue uh, where I really sensed you were trying to shine some light and say, well, maybe there's a way forward. But I came out of it really with a sense of despair. So what can you do to disabuse me of my sense of despair? You need to look, you know, I mean, you sort of need to look at those societies the way people who are trying to change them are. And if they think, you know, Fawzi al-Bakr, who I talked about in Saudi Arabia, she was talking about the amount of religion in textbooks. Mm. And, you know, she was saying that to challenge the government, they say, you know, well, if you're teaching them all this religion, you know, where are the Arab Microsofts? Where are the Arab Apple computers? You know, we used to, um, in the Middle Ages, we controlled science in, in, the, in the world, and now look where we are. Mm. Um, and so I think you sort of need to find the people that are asking the right questions in those societies and support them. So you're not as drearily pessimistic as I am about the future? You know, I, 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 I switch back and forth. You know, when I spend time with those kind of people, I think it's great. And then, you know, you sort of see governments like the King of Jordan, and, you know, we, we they have this great reputation in this country, you know, the King of Queen and Jordan, they're sort of telegenic and great, and they say all the right things about Islam and democracy. But in their own country, you know, when the government came up uh, with a plan to open up, you know, to find a way to create greater democracy, you know, the king shelved it and, and changed the prime minister. So it is hard to be... Um, optimistic about change in a lot of these places, but as I said, I just sort of keep going back to the people that I, that I talk to that are trying to do it, and they give me hope. Hmm. Well, we've been speaking to Neil McFarquhar, uh, the author of The Excellent. This is a book that you'll read in about three and a half to four hour, two four-hour shifts, I think. <laughs> the Media Relations Department of Hezbollah wishes you a happy birthday. We wish you another great book. And what's your next beat? What are you working on right now? Uh, I work at the UN now, mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm looking at a lot at food issues, actually. Mm -hmm. That's sort of captured my attention. Another culture that inspires <laughs> despair, the UN, or less despair? Uh, I would say more dis Well, you know, it, if it, it, it should exist, the UN. It may not be the greatest talking form on the earth, but yeah, it's good that it's there. Neil McFarquhar, thank you so much for coming to Faith Complex today. Thank you.